Very honored to be here. Very excited to be teaching with you guys, learning with you guys. Um, I do have a presentation. I've been collecting some of my hottest takes over the past several months, stuff that people haven't heard. And I wanted to um, run through that with you, with you guys. So let me, uh, can we share my screen? All right, here we go. Are you guys ready? I actually have never presented this before. I actually don't know how long it's gonna take. I'm probably gonna go extra fast so we leave some time for questions. Um, but I'm Jess Bachman, Creative Strategy Director at Fireteam. We are a performance-focused creative strategy and production agency working with seven to nine-figure brands. This is uh, my team. Apparently, we're, we're from hell um, as well. We have this weird Icelandic domain. Uh, don't ask me why. I don't know. And then I'm on Twitter or all the other social medias at Hire Fire Team. And you can find me on LinkedIn as well. So my goal here, my true goal is to deliver as much value as fast as I can jam in here. Um, if you feel that any of these particular takes are delivering value, I'd love to see like a fire emoji in the chat or something. If you feel that these are not delivering value, feel free to shout at me on Twitter so I know who to block. All right, so here we go. Let's get started with the first one, how to spot bad creative advice. Now we're all looking to learn from each other and stuff. But there is a few guardrails before you just suck in someone else's hot take. Um, and I have a few red flags. Uh, this is doesn't apply to anyone in particular. But my few red flags are single brand operators. So these are people who um, made it big from one particular brand, or they only work at one particular brand, and they can be in amazingly smart people, but they've also built their business in a particular way that suits their particular business and their marketing strategy revolves around that. So just be careful to see that might not apply to what you're doing. If they speak in absolutes, something will always work. This is the solution. Um, only the Sith uh, speak in absolutes. So be careful, they might be a Sith Lord or something like that. Uh, and then lastly, they are clearly selling you something. So Everyone on the internet is basically selling you something. Every expert is selling you something. Um, that doesn't mean that you discount what they say automatically, but just try to be cognizant of what they are selling because that may affect how they are speaking or the con content that they are delivering. What am I selling you to right now? Like, so be skeptical of, of what I'm saying to say as well. And if they are clearly selling you something, um, then be hyper skeptical as well. All right. The, the eternal debate of agency versus in-house. I do work at an agency, so which is better, agency or in-house? The answer is it's in-house. There is, you will find no one that cares more about your business than the people that rely on those paychecks to, to keep it going. And so you, you won't find a more hardworking, dedicated people than your own particular staff. However, there's a huge asterisk involved here. That asterisk is um, if you can attract and retain exceptional talent and have a plan to combat the creative compartmentalization that always plagues in-house teams. That is a huge caveat, but it's something that sort of always happens. If you, if you can get around that, if you can fix that, your in-house team is going to be amazing. Um, but if not, this, like, this is the whole reason why agencies exist to combat this particular um, thing. So I like to think of agencies and his house as like the, um, the epic handshake, both working together in, in conflict. And it, so, I mean, cause you need, you need both sides of this coin. So on the agency side, you do want fresh and multi perspectives. Agency have seen a lot of different accounts and they can apply what's working to other accounts. Um, it's also, you know, good talent on demand for the most part. On the on in-house side, you have a deeper focus. No one knows your business more than people that do it 40 hours a week and all the various particulars that, that are involved there. And also, it can certainly be cheaper at scale once you have, uh, once you're sort of staffed up as well. So what you really want here is competition 
between your agency and your in-house team where the agency and in-house team are trying to create better ads than each other and they're learning from each other. And that is the most, that's like the best outcome uh, that we generally see in accounts. Um, we like to see about like 50% of your ad spend going to like agency or con or contractors or whatever, and the other 50 cent being in-house. That is a, a pretty solid mix there. Um, if you go, if you're like 80% agency-based creative, then maybe you need to beef up your in-house team a little bit or there's something going on or maybe your agency has too much power or something. And then if it's 80% in-house creative, then maybe it's your agency's not making the best stuff and you should find another one or something. But you, there, there is no, I've never seen it, I've never seen it truly success with one or the other. It's always a collaboration and a competition um, between these. So when do you get an agency? Well, to answer that first, we need to talk about how much to spend on creative production, because these are huge decisions that brands need to make uh, all the time. And so basically, if I like to look at it as a like percentage of ad spend and anywhere between 5% to 15% of your ad spend on creative production. So let's say you, you spend 100k a, a month, that's anywhere between 5k to 15k is is a solid place to be. I feel like the sweet spot is right around 10%. Um, however, if it's you try to make it work with less than 5%, you're kind of shooting yourself on your foot, and you probably don't have can create the right creative to scale the account. And if you're more than 15%, there's probably some certainly some efficiencies that can be made to to get that down as well. <clears throat> So if we put this in sort of like a column, like with monthly ad spend and the solution here, so if you're $1,000 a month, that's about 10% you would spend on creative, so $100. This is where you are picking up the phone yourself and shooting it or working with your family or whatever. That's the DIY solution. $10,000, you have 1000 to spend. This is where you start to work with contractors. There's lots of good ones for various different price points. 50,000, you're now spending 5,000 on creative. This is where you can get uh, a cheap agency. There's plenty of those as well. $100,000, this is where you're spending $10,000 a month on creative production. This is where you can afford to hire a, a good agency. And then, you know, keep going up where you're spending 500,000, so 50,000. So this is where you have a good agency and you will start to building out that in-house team. You're hiring a creative strategist. Uh, you're putting your, your graphic designer on stuff. Uh, maybe you have a video editor, something like that. Uh, it's gonna be important. When you're spending over a million and you have a lot to spend, uh, this is where you're really developing your in-house team and it's supplemented by good agencies. Um, and it doesn't scale infinitely or whatever. You're like there's lots of agencies or efficiencies once you're rolling in house, but this is generally uh, the range that I like to see. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so accounts should be mostly video. Um, I'm not sure if this is a hot take, but I definitely see people who are like static is crushing right now, and. So we need to think of static as what it is. Static images simply has less persuasive power than video. Video is the real deal. You are, you have voiceover, you have people, you have dialogue, you have music, you have motion, you can see people's expressions, you can explain stuff. Video will do the most of the persuasion. Static does work. I'm not saying static does not work, but it only works on the people that don't need a lot of persuasion. So if we think of the different stages of awareness from unaware down to the most aware, the static video will work on people who are lower in those stages of awareness. If you go into your ad accounts right now and you filter by static versus video and you look at the frequency of static images, you will find that it's higher than the video. Now, why is it higher? Because there's a smaller pool of people that static images work. People that already know your brand, maybe they're already been hitting with remarketing or whatever. Um, so that is where static does work. And that's where the static should be focused around. This is why it's very rational, like features or benefits or, or those types of things. But video, you need video to fill the funnel. You need video to convince people who don't care, who don't have time, who aren't already seeking a solution to persuade them. And video will do that. So video to fill the funnel, static to empty it. It's never one or the other. In fact, when we see accounts that are static heavy, that is a sign of 
uh, either an unhealthy account or a very large brand that has all kinds of a bunch of unaided awareness because they're they're just huge. And so they need that static to fill the or flush out the very large funnel. So do you need to crack the video code? Do not feel like you can scale to, you know, seven, eight, nine figures just with uh, static images. <clears throat> so the most important creative metric, everyone feels like they have one that they love. I would love to know in the chat what you feel that the most important creative metric is. Is it hold rate? Like, what do you look at first? Like, what to you is is matters most? <clears throat> ROAS, okay, there we go. Spend, I love spend. <laughs> CCT, because you told us in your tweet? Yes, okay. So you are right. The answer is CCT. Now, I guarantee, I guarantee you, no one has heard of this because I literally made it up recently. But however, I do believe that this is fundamentally the account, the, the metric that you should orient your entire business about. What is CCT? Uh, CCT is the creative cycle time. The, the creative cycle time. I'll, I'll explain what that is in a little bit more depth, but we've worked with a lot of different brands and the brands that are growing the fastest are able to adapt to, to the trends are the ones with the lowest creative cycle time. And the other ones who are, who are struggling and growing slowly or like maybe it's not ads, maybe it's landing pages or just uh, you know spinning tops have the highest creative cycle time. So let's get into this. Creative cycle time, what is it? Basically all ads are guesses. Any ad you put out there is a guess. You don't know if it works. But the iterations on those are educated guesses. They should have a higher chance of working. And so basically what we want to have here is this is the cycle. You put an ad and you, and you test it. You put, you put money behind it. You get data. You see if it works or not. Um, and then you analyze that data. And you, you, know, you look in motion. You look in reports. You, you figure out what's working or what's not. And then based off that, you then make another ad. So that includes, you know, production, maybe it's edits, or maybe it's a different idea or something. And then once you make that other ad, you put that back in the market and it, and it repeats again. <clears throat> so there's what you really need to do here is learn how to first, it'd be interesting to go into your own organizations and see how long it takes you to put an ad and then to get an iteration of that ad back into market, see how long that might take you. Um, and then you want to look at every stage and be like, how can I squeeze the time to do these different stages? So um, for testing an ad, ad spend is a function of time. You could, you could spend $5 a day on an ad and test it in, in a year, or you could spend $500 a day and test it uh, in, a, in a couple of days. That doesn't mean that's the right strategy, but um, ad spend will compress time. Testing structure, you do need a good testing structure. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then, so what you need to be careful of is that if you're not spending on an ad, you are not getting a result. If people say Meta knows uh, winners are losers with $4 to spend, uh, it's not true. It's not true. Um, so if you're not spending, you're not getting results. If there's no results, there's no action to be taken there. There's nothing you can do. Uh, a a non-result is, is worse than discovering a loser. Like I want to find a loser so that I can then possibly fix it or figure out why it's a loser and turn that into a learning. A non-result uh, will slow you down significantly. And then no action means no change. You can't do anything with it and you're just kind of stuck. So I often see when we do audits accounts that just are not spending enough to get any type of result or change or just cycle at all. Um, so the, the analyst part is, is all three parts of these are hugely important. So you do need competent tools to, to that aid in the speed of analytics and also the dissemination of, of information. Um, motion bar, bar none is like hands down the best. I don't even know if there's other tools, but it's, it, motion is the one you need to get. Uh, the second part of this is great, particularly fast communication. So this, so I'm talking about between the media buyer and the creatives on your team, like the media buyer is looking at this stuff and they need to be like, okay, this is working. This is not working. Give that data or the reports or whatever to the creative. So then they can, um, 
do what they have to do. Or if you're working with an agency and the brand is doing the media buying, you need to give that information to the agency and the agency needs to give back the information of what they're going to do. So communication is key and figure out different ways to optimize for quicker, faster communication. Again, motion is one of those tools where your like your the, your agency can be in motion or your creative strategist can be in motion and your media buyer so it is one of those tools where you can almost eliminate this step if you have both competent people on your team and so eliminating uh, a huge part of this step is key so if you're talking the same language using the same tools um that would be ideal and lastly be careful that your reporting frequency can be a speed limit. So if you are like, we report on our ads every month, and then once you figure out what are the learnings, then you re then you you know create iterations from that. Well, now you've you've hard coded into your process a one month cycle time at the very least. You don't have to do that. You can report uh, weekly, or you can do no reporting and have your your creative strategist in motion or something figuring out. So just be very careful about hard coding parts of your cycle time. Then you need to make an ad. This is, this is also challenging. You need a talented creative team uh, that, that knows what it's doing uh, as well. You need good creator relationships. Uh, if you work with creators a lot, you need to pay their rates. Because if, if you go back to them and be like, hey, I need to do this quick edit, you don't want them to be like, all right, you're now like ninth in the queue because you haggled with me over $200 or something like that. So good creative relationships is is the grease to, to this particular flywheel. Also, if you do work with an agency, I highly suggest very flexible scope of works where, again, you are not hard coding um, you know, lengthy deliveries or monthly deliveries or something like that into this particular cycle time. Uh, and then to be aware of is the slow approvals or feedbacks. If you're from a brand or if you're a creative strategist, you need to be Johnny on the spot when you are presented with creative because every day that you're like, oh, I'll get to that. I'll get to that later. Every day you're, you are ignoring that adding days to the creative cycle time. So um, be careful about that. So in the best cases, or not the best cases, but ideally where you want to be is at a two-week creative cycle time. This is where everything is running properly. You, you take an ad, you test it, you get the data, you give it to the creative team, they make another ad, and then it's back in market two weeks later. This will allow you to um, iterate off trends that are happening. This will allow you to you know, change where the market is going or, or just... The, the faster you can acquire learnings, the better. Um, <clears throat> I've definitely seen a lot of four-week cradle cycle time or more. It is non-ideal. It is, it is the path to slow growth. It is possible to be on a one-week cadence. Um, I've done it. It feels kind of like a sprint, and you, like, everyone needs to be good at, good at their jobs across both or every organization, um, but it's certainly possible. And so... The, the, the reason why this is so important is because if you are, if you have a creative cycle time of one week, you're putting some market and you're changing and you're growing and your competitors have, you know, four weeks, you are, you're just going to outpace them, periodly. Or if you are, if you have a one month creative cycle time because of your approval process or whatever relationships that you have, or you can't get on the phone with a creator, or it takes forever to get, you know, approvals or something, and your competitors are cycling every two weeks, they're just, they're going to learn twice as fast, they're going to adapt twice as fast, and they're going to leave you in the dust. I'll say that new concepts should be on the two-week basis. If they're just small iterations or small changes to a particular ad, uh, I would expect it to be on a one-week basis as well. How, how is this resonating with any of you guys? I'd love to see that. Love to see that in the chat. I'm just talking so fast. I can barely even uh, fire. Okay, quadruple fire, triple fire. Okay, okay. Okay, is there, do we have five, oh, six fires? Okay, I think I'm on the right track here. Here we go, here we go. All right, most people think they are testing concepts when they're actually testing execution. So for example, you have this like great idea, you have this like Cardi B level idea and you write a great script or whatever and then uh, you get the ad back and it's like, uh, it's, not, it's not quite what I was talking about. So what's happening here is, there's lots of reasons why this ad may have failed. Uh, maybe it was like 
a bad creator or the read wasn't particular good or maybe it was like a not a very good edit or something as well and then lastly maybe maybe it was a bad concept but you don't know if it's a bad concept until you've had a good creator and a good edit on this particular ad so don't if you if you make an ad and it fails it's like you know that concept doesn't work or if you steal an ad from you know savannah sanchez and you're like oh this didn't work the idea didn't work it may be it may be because you're not as good as her as pulling it off so if you can get better at that then you can finally test concepts so you are not testing concepts until your execution is consistently on point once you get to that stage then you can be like you know what this concept doesn't work everything went right it just it's the concept or the script or whatever that failed <clears throat> So winning concepts are bigger than winning ads. Everyone loves to share winning ads, uh, including myself. Here's a winning ad for, for one of our clients. It's a static ad. Um, choose six, it ties into choice, uh, whatever. Last 90 days, <clears throat> uh, 700K spend on this ad. It did, it did very well. I, I may have posted this on Twitter or something. So this ad is a winner. It's a success. But you, you once you get a winner... Do not stop there. There is more to be mined in the concept. So think about what about this ad makes it a winner. Um, and so in, in Notion, you can like tag various things. And I encourage you to tag ads by a particular concept. So this, this ad is tagged by choice. After we made this ad, we then explored the concept. So this is a winning concept. <laughs> like really loud it'll be over in just a second <clears throat> okay <clears throat> don't know if you could hear that music but it was like blasting my ears so this so we looked at choice and we're like how many different ways can we iterate on this particular concept um and it has almost double double the spend so what we find here is that when you find something that works you're not that's that's great you do a victory lap, get back to the plate. There's more to do here. If you find a winning ad, you can double or more the success of um, by finding a winning concept. So really don't just be like, don't just try and fix the losers. Like what are the winners? Why are they winning? And, and then develop more of that. Um, we do it over and over again. <clears throat> if someone uses the word Bayesian, that is your cue to nope out of the conversation. Um, just trust me on this. I will not explain it further. It is what it is. Okay. Creative production efficiency is a trap. Um, I do love this one, this, uh, this one. So a lot of people are like, you know, we test, we test 40 ads a week. We test 160 ads a month or Mo ads is more winners. If you want more winners, you need, just need to flood your ad account with ads. Um, that strategy can work. I'm not saying that's not right. It can work. But in order for it to work, you need to prioritize creative production efficiency. You need to know how to make 160 ads uh, in, in, a, in a month. You need to figure out, you know, cheaply and, and like make a profit on that. So you need to prioritize creative production efficiency. This often leads to cheap uh, offshore talent. There's a lot of great, a lot of great offshore talent. Some of it is not cheap, some of it is cookie cutter concepts as well. And also there's just no cycle time built in. If you think it, how hard it is to make 160 ads a month, think about how hard it is to report on, on that. It is, it, is, it is not gonna happen. And so what you, what you need to always have in the back of your head, because it, it can be such a desire to be like, how can I do, do more of this, and, you know, make it more cheaper or whatever. Meta's, that should say algo, Meta's algo does not care how efficient your creative production is. That's just not information that you feed into the algorithm whatsoever. Meta, Meta works by basically spend flows to good ads, not cheaply made ads. Uh, and this is, I'm sorry, this has been true for all of advertising uh, as well. It's not just Meta's algorithm. It is like a universal truth within marketing. Um, better stuff will, will get more attention. So the key here is to make less but better ads. 
So this will have this can this can be cheaper because you're making less ads. However, you do have to put in the systems to make better ads. But ideally, when you're making less but better ads, you're also learning more. Like the cycle time is so important. You are learning more. You're taking those learnings and you're feeding them throughout the organization as well. Um, and it's hugely important. I just need to let my dog out. I'll be right back. Thank you. I wish my dog could open doorknobs. Um, but we haven't reached that level of training yet. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Moving on. Evan, how are we doing on time here? Good. Thumbs up. All right. Appreciate that. All right, here we go. The best creative skill to develop when evaluating ads. So who is evaluating ads? That's uh, video editors as you're making it, creative strategists as you're reviewing it, uh, brand owners or whatever if you're reviewing it. If you're looking at other people's ads to figure out what might work or what, what doesn't work, e e basically everyone is evaluating ads. And um, like we have a whole show called Adtopsy where we do this live. And the number one skill, like you can read all the, you know, pop psychologist marketing books or whatever and try to hold all that in your head but nothing is going to compare to developing this one skill which is noticing how you feel when watching an ad so you ask yourself two questions what am i feeling while watching this ad on a second by second basis like you need to turn up the sensitivity on your brain and the emotions that are flooding through it and ask yourself, what am I feeling? Am I bored? Am I engaged? Am I confused? Which is a, probably the number one problem of ads. Um, or do I feel like, I don't know, something is off. So like you're watching an ad and you just, you just identify, okay, I feel, I'm feeling something. What is that something? And come up with that particular answer. Once you have that, you ask the second question, and this second question will help you deliver feedback, make edits or whatever, which is why am I feeling this? So it's like, am I bored? Okay, so maybe there's like, there's a cut that's like too long or something, and we just need some more cuts in here to improve that. Uh, am I engaged? Maybe because this is a great creator and a great read, and I just feel myself engaged in what this person is talking about. Let's use that creator again on five more projects. Am I confused? Now, you do need to look at your ads as someone who doesn't know everything about the brand or hasn't read the brief or whatever, which is uh, challenging in of itself, but like just feel a little bit of confusion. You're like, okay, maybe I I was a little confused at this part, so I'm going to add a banner to give it a little bit of extra context, something like that. Do I feel off? Identify what that is. Maybe like the music vibe didn't fit or something, and so make that change. So these two questions will, I would stack up these two questions. If you're good at the skill versus like, you know, 100 pounds of marketing psychology books uh, in your brain. So how to create test creative like a, a baseball empire. I'm, I make typos all the time. Um, deal with it uh, the right way. So this one is, um, I don't know why this is like the spiciest take or why uh, there's camps around this, but uh, I'll give you my version uh, of this. Okay. Um, here we go. Can you guys still hear me? I got like a weird notification. Okay, great. Uh, here we go. So just a warning, we have an overly, overly elaborate metaphor warning going on here. I love metaphors. I do think they help explain things. Um, if you are not familiar with baseball, uh, I deeply apologize to what's about to happen. But <clears throat> here we go. This is a metaphor. We have a batter, catcher, and an umpire. You are the umpire. Your job is to judge balls, strikes, whatever. The ad, a new ad that you're testing, is uh, the batter here. And then each swing is the CPA worth of ad spend. So if your CPA is like $100, each $100 of ad spend, we can say, is a swing. The catcher is not in this metaphor, so don't worry about it. So let's look at this um, in a different perspective. So if a, the CPA is $100 and the ad spend, we have purchases, you spend $100, zero purchases, well, that's a strike. That's a strike. Strike one. Here we go. $200 to spend. No purchases. Strike two. Here we go. You know how this works. Baseball. $300 worth of purchase. $300 worth of ad spend. Zero purchases. Strike three. You're out of there. 
um, you can you can cut that ad. Um, it's done. However, however, it's not that simple. And this is where the skill, your skill, of an, an umpire uh, comes into play. For example, if we go back to here, and we have you know we spent another hundred dollars, we do have purchase. That's not a strike. That's a foul. Something's working here. You made contact. This is not a uh, a hit or whatever, but we can continue to spend because we haven't struck out. We spend another one. We got another purchase. That's another foul. Here we go. And then so we spend another $100. We got zero purchases. There's a third strike. And again, you can cut that ad for sure. That's generally, so, that's, so this is like when people say like, you know, three to five times the CPA of, of, of the what you should be spending on testing a particular ad. This is kind of like the guts of how that should work. Uh, and now it does get a little more complicated um, as well. So let's say we have three strikes, uh, $300 in purchases or $300 in ad spend, no purchases. Are you going to cut that ad? Well, Problem is, it's got no purchases, but the thumb stop is actually excellent. So there's something working here, or maybe the hold rate is like is really good. So there's something kind of working here. So we're going to say that last strike is a foul, and we're just going to give it a little extra bit of lead. And if we, you know, we keep going down, and if if, if it feels like the ad is working, then you can give it a little bit of rope. However. No, you can't just foul off forever. At some point, you, you know, you are going to strike out. Someone's going to catch the foul or whatever. And so you do need to make that particular call. And that is your job as, as a media buyer looking at this stuff or a creative strategist who is evaluating the performance of these ads. This is your job. And now, so... The other thing is we rare so we rarely find ads get to using this particular method. We rarely find that ads get to ten times the CPA, um, and that are they are still a loser. They may be lower. They maybe have a lower ROAS across like the entire spend, but they you should be seeing them get better over like the last week or the last few days or the last quarter of spend. So when does an ad become a hit? The CPA is hundred dollars. We'll say a hit, a single is 10 times the CPA. That's $1,000. That is a, that is not a home run. That is not a quote unquote winner. That is just a single. It, it did its job. It got $1,000 worth of spend and it wasn't either, um, it wasn't unprofitable or it wasn't terrible. A uh, hundred times the CPA, we'll call that a double as 10,000. A thousand times the CPA, we'll call it a triple. That's a hundred thousand dollars in spend on an ad unit. A thousand times the CPA, that is what we're calling the uh, bases clearing home run, a million dollars, very hard to do, only works with like very large brands. However, the thing about this is like people share like the super mega winners or a lot of times we'll auditing in accounts and they'll just make one ad that's just hoovering up all the spend. Maybe it's a triple, maybe it's a home run or something. And those are great to have in the account, but it's the singles and doubles that are going to generate the runs, the singles and doubles are, they go after like the home run will go after it's one ad. So it's going to appeal to one type of person and maybe like a pretty broad person and it's pretty effective, but it's going to appeal to one type of person. And this is why you need to explore the concept because there'll be other ads that have similar, but that appeal to a slightly different person or resonate a little bit in a different way. And those can be singles and doubles. And if you start adding those up, then you're all of a sudden you're at $2 million to spend versus just a million. So singles and doubles win ball games. I know Andrew Ferris would disagree with me based on a purely baseball point of view, and he'd probably be right. But in terms of the ad account point of view, uh, he's definitely wrong. All right. The amount you spend testing creative should be proportionate to your confidence in the creative. So, uh, so there's lots of tactics where you just like flood the account with a hundred random UGC things from seeding, whatever, or you have an ad with it's like 20 hooks on it and you, you have no idea what works. These are viable strategies. What you should not do is use the, the previous media buying testing strategy on 
this stuff. If you have random UGC, you don't know if it works, no idea, then yeah, give it 50 cents. Put it in a freaking giant AAC or whatever and just see where Meta likes to land on it. You're basically... Your batters are basically like Little League here, and you're just like tossing on a ball and see who gets hit with the ball and gets, gets the first, you know, whatever. That's that's fine, perfectly fine strategy. But if you're working with good in-house or agency creative or iterations, like iterations are versions of stuff that like either does work or kind of works. So you have high confidence that they're going to spend well. So we want the three times the CPA at minimum. This is the three strikes, the three strikes rule at minimum. This is basically, if you're running with these types of ads, this is basically your dugout of highly, play, highly paid professional ball players. There's nothing that breaks my heart more than making an amazing ad and seeing it sit in some cost cap creative testing account with $4 of spend for weeks. Um, it's, it br truly brings tears to my eyes. So with that, the creative testing structure, actually it doesn't matter. Only spend and time matter. So if you wanna do uh, an ABO with dedicated spend, that's fine. If you wanna do an ASC of, of only um, new stuff, that's great. If you wanna do a CBO with like a little bit of minimum spend in there, uh, that's fine. All these things are totally fine as long as ads are getting spent in a reasonable amount of time. If you have like an AFC with, with the mega winner in it, like the home run from two years ago, and it's sucking up all the spend, that is, that's not testing uh, at all. And that's, that's lengthening the cycle time of the whole, whole organization. Um, and then lastly, and this probably isn't a hot take, because um, it, it shouldn't be, is that Evan Lee is the best MC in the entire in the entire biz um and i wanted to thank uh all y'all guys from having me on uncontroversial <laughs> just this is the definition of fire there's so many amazing uh well just like takes in general your dog came you should see how many questions have come in of just like i want to see your dog jess can we see your dog jess please 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 <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm at a standing desk and he's like 120 pounds. So I, I'm, I need some gains in order for that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you definitely delivered the chat's going been crazy the entire time. So I feel like you've definitely delivered, man. I don't know how much you've been able to keep up as you're going through it, but amazing. amazing. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Everyone oh, in the chat. Man. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So folks, we have 12 minutes left here for Q and a, uh, so please just visit there, throw in your questions. Also keep upvoting. Alexandria has taken over and everyone wants to know what's going on there. So I feel like we need to do it justice. And Alexandria, the first question is of course going to be yours. But Jess, how often should creatives be refreshed or rotated to avoid ad fatigue? Uh, so that's an interesting question because you wouldn't, you don't make, you don't make an edit to something that already is working. And so once you determine that it, that it that it is working you you let it ride until it fatigues what you want to do of is get ahead of the fatigue um so i would like to, like if you can get new creative on a weekly or bi-weekly basis at um at a minimum that that's where i'd want to be even on even on smaller accounts so there's, no, there's not a monthly thing yeah. yeah, yeah, it's such a helpful framework. Honestly, it's like you can be overprotective almost. And it's just like, how can we let the data to tell us like when stuff like this needs yep. to be addressed? The, so the one the one caveat that we see is you can get more creative into account than you can effectively test, particularly at a lower spend rate. So if you're like, oh, I just got a freaking 50 batch of creatives and you're only spending like 20K a month, uh, it's going to take forever to to do that. So to test that properly as well. Amazing. And then Alexandra, we need to do right by you before I get to some other people. So the other question that I'm going to pull up here is just how do you prioritize which creative elements to test first? So you prioritize whatever is at the front of the ad. That's what most people see. That is what will kick off the creative targeting in the direction it needs to go. If people are confused, um, it, 
I we usually just like throw a banner on in the front to give it a little bit of, you know, creative targeting juice or a little clarity or something. So start with the first three seconds and then go in three second chunks. Anything after uh, like 25 seconds is probably not worth spending a lot of time on. Hmm. I love that. I love that. And just earlier on, you talked a lot about formats and like the opinion on static first, uh, like videos and how videos help with the education a ton. So Jeremy's mm -hmm. popping in with a question. So Jeremy from New Zealand, first of all, welcome to the party. I know it's either super late or super early. So thank you. But Jeremy asks, how do you optimize your workflow for format? E.g. do you produce landscape portrait and square versions of everything? Am I being lazy when I just do portrait with a lot of free space? How do you approach this? No, it, it kind of depends on the size of your brand because uh, iterating on formats can, it's like you're, you're adding a whole different export, which can add time uh, and cost and may have marginal gain depending on how much spend you have. Um, so generally for our larger brands, um, you know, we, we deliver nine by 16s, we do squares, we do four by fives that are very particular. Um, but if, if you're spending like under, I'd probably say 75K a month, I really would not stress exporting a whole bunch of different formats and trying to squeeze out juice from that. And when we're thinking about just like starting to launch into the account, one of the pieces you had mentioned is just like spend wise, how much creative you should be testing. But Meryl has a good question here. So Meryl asks, how many net new creatives versus iterations should be launching each week, bi-weekly month? Uh, and yep. how do you define net new creative content? <laughs> Yep. So a, a net new creative, you can iterate off a, a winning concept with a different version of the script or something. I would say that is a iteration, but it's also net new because you have to produce, maybe you need a, another creator read or something like that. Um, so I, I generally like to see about 50% uh, net new versus iterations. A lot, of t a lot of people will be like, oh, iterations is so, it's so easy. There's no value in that. Like the iterations are, are, the iterations are what works. You know, you need the iterations to, like, we don't, we don't step up to the plate and hit a home run on the first swing. You know, it, you do need to have a few swings at it to, to get to that state. So do not sleep on iterations. Also, um, if your agency is only doing iterations, push them to do net new because um, that's what will find new new audiences as well. Yeah, I think people always talk about too about iterating yourself and the algorithm into a corner. So I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. Like, are you a believer? Is it uh, where's your head at? <clears throat> yeah. So we'll we'll usually it really depends on what you're looking at in motion. If you can, we you know we start with the hook rate and, and we can make some changes to that. And if it works great but if we don't we don't rehab an ad like you you know you need to know when to like <laughs> when you know when you cut your player when he sucks you know if, if you're trying to help him out you're trying to like oh you change your swing and he's still striking out uh you do you, you can't have emotional attachment to the ideas or the creatives uh you do need to cut them and move on because there's a better idea waiting for it that deserves your time you know you say that so easily, but that's like so many people's babies that they're just like, oh, that was the one right there. How can we? But I think it's it's yeah. good to be pragmatic ultimately and like make those decisions, right? Yeah. Our our Slack is full of dead babies is what I'll say. <laughs> RP, RP to the fallen ones. Uh, Sam has a good question here. So I think this touches upon like creative testing. I know you're quite flexible in all honesty, but it touches upon it. So Sam is asking, what is your solution for an ad that performed well in a creative testing campaign, but didn't have the same performance once you moved it to a winning campaign or ad set? Yeah, so um, it could be that the ad set or the campaign already has particular learnings based off what type of ads are already winning there. And that your, your, your ad that you're testing um, has space to find the people in the algorithm that resonate with that particular ad. And maybe it's a little bit of a different demographic or, you know, people that maybe it's a different trend or something. And then, so when you move it, uh, it's, it now needs to swim in that particular, you know, pool, which might be, ha have different learnings or something. So um, I do feel that if you want to like broaden, like really broaden the account, it is important to try and group together uh, concepts or ideas within particular ad sets so they can um, overlap with only the like the right people and allow new concepts and new ideas to to thrive. 
I feel like I can always count on you for the metaphors and bring it there. So swimming pools, <laughs> baseball metaphors. That's, We're good, man. Yeah. We're good. I get paid uh, eight, by metaphor. Paid by metaphor. It. Whoo! There we go. <laughs> So Ace is jumping in. Ace has a question. How are you organizing, keeping track of, et cetera, different ad angles, messaging concepts, ad formats, after, uh, et cetera, that are being developed and launched? Yeah. So um, we generally, well, so we use Notion. We're big believers in Notion. Um, Notion's a, a platform where you need to bring your system to Notion. It will not provide the system for you. But once you have a system, uh, then it can do very well. We actually used to use uh, Notion for ad reporting as well. We'd take data and then bring it back to into Notion. And that, but that was before we switched to Motion, which I has that saved us. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've entirely ditched that because Motion is clearly the better tool. And Jess, I think this is a good segue into just like tooling in general, because I'm seeing a pretty common theme of people asking about different steps in your process. So Reza specifically has a question of like, what are your thoughts on using Air versus Dropbox versus Google Drive? But I've also seen other questions of like your tech stack in general, as it relates to AI, as it relates to like literally like editing videos. Um, mm -hmm. So curious if you can just drop some of your tech stack. Yeah, so we used to use Google Drive, particularly Google Drive Stream, which takes Google Drive and puts it on your hard drive. Like, that's the only way to use a Google Drive. We then switched over to Air because I was convinced otherwise. They have something called Airflow, which I, I had to say it, it had some problems. Um, mm -hmm. And so here's here's a, a one little tip that, uh, Ke or Evan, that you're going to hate. But in regarding to SaaS businesses and companies, you can complain. You can complain and get your bill down. You can complain and get free months or whatever. Feel free to be vocal. If you're like, motion is too expensive. It's, it is expensive, but it's worth it. But you're like, motion is too expensive. Uh, complain. Maybe they'll give you a discount or something. But absolutely, you need to get on that platform. So um, <laughs> I don't know. I use, we use Air currently. I feel like the part that I tap into there is just like be human on both ends. Like that's how I approach it. Like even Jess, yeah. me and you in our first conversation, like we kept it like completely just like organic on the approach. So we made sure that it was just like a spot that we're all happy with at the end of the day. Yep. Yep. And the, I, the smaller the companies, the better they are to work with you as well. Um, mm -hmm. I would not expect this type of thing from Adobe. If you're like, eh, you're too expensive. Uh, it's not going to happen. You know, uh, Jess, the only part of this that I'm curious about is so we touched upon like air moving from Google Drive. I think just to like round out the rest of the stack, you talked about motion, but let's talk about like literally editing. Editing. Are you using frame.io to like send comments back and forth? Are you in like CapCut or what are you using? So we use Adobe Suite for, for all editing. We have an in-house editor. Um, we use Slack to do uh, comms basically we'll post the ad we have a special channel that's called ad review anytime someone gets posted there you know it's like very present in people's slacks you know that you need to comment on that our whole team is has the ability to comment on our ads it's not like just the client or just whatever our, our account people comment on the ads and so slack is actually the best tool to categorize uh, and keep that I and mean, we've explored other options um, and it's like, it can be cool if there's like one feature where you're like, I want to highlight a thing in the video. That's not a feature that, that is going to get over that. If you have l worse communication, but better ability to draw a circle on the screen, that's not a, that's not a, that's not the move, you know, solving the right problem every single time is so important regardless <laughs> of the bells and whistles. Right. Yeah. I think exactly. we have time for potentially one more question here. And it's one that I've seen a through line about as well. So Cassidy is asking, which would you recommend content that performed well on social organically and could be seen as ad friendly to be tried as an ad? And just the through line here is that I've also seen another question that asks the same thing about TV. Like if we're seeing hmm. success on TV, are there things and learnings we can take? So, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> TV is a hugely separate conversation. But if you see something that performs well on social, I would not dump it into your ad account and expect performance. One thing we do see when that happens is like it gets great engagement, but it's not it needs to sell like your ads need to sell. They can't entertain. And a lot of times we'll make ads that like entertain people and they'll stay for like a minute. But we're not we're not doing the selling. And so a lot of times these organic things um, won't do the selling. So my 
our tactic or what I suggest is to, we have this, we, we have this concept called a base unit where it's basically an ad that has all the features and benefits, best testimonials, whatever, it's about 30 seconds. Um, throw that base unit onto the end of the organic content. So people, if people get to it, they'll probably stay to watch a little bit more. And now you have that selling component and that might have a better chance of, of rising in the ranks. I love it. Jess, you came through absolutely smashed it. I'm just curious, like, are there any final words that you want to leave with the people? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm literally about to pass out because it's so hot in my office right now and I'm wearing a sweater, but I appreciate everyone um, from coming on. It's an honor to be here with you guys and all these other gals that were, that were on stage as well. Um, follow everything. You, you literally can't go wrong. I agree with everyone that has been on stage so far. So we're, you're in good company. Jess, absolutely incredible people. We have, to throw, we have to throw some love in the chat here. Have to, have to. Jess did not disappoint when we we're talking about creative hot takes and spitting creative fire. So let's please chat, show them some love, show them some love. <laughs> Is my Jess, wife is I my wife still in the chat or did she did she give up on me? Was no, she we'll here? See. Jump in, please. Like we got to all caps, all caps. Hi Jess, hi Jess. And then your kids too. We got to get your kids in there. <laughs> uh, Sweet, incredible. love it. Love it. Appreciate you Jess. Everyone else, uh we've reached the time of the show, There's no pressure at all. If you are interested, just talked a lot about motion and I'd love to show you all a little bit of where we can help relating to some of the pieces he had he had mentioned. Honestly, no pressure if not, by the way. I'm here to hang out with you all, kick back, relax, and talk all things creative strategy. Okay, everybody? Amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Fantastic. <laughs> Christiana is saying, tell us about the map. The map, that is my conversation starter of where I've been in around the world. ASMR Evan. Yeah, we'll bring it back. Trust me, I got you all. But Everyone, before I jump into motion, I also just wanted to say, like, really appreciate everyone's eyes and ears throughout this entire webinar series that we've hosted called Make Ads That Convert. I think everyone in the chat can literally tell, like, this is an amazing community. You see how engaged everyone is, not just yourself typing into the chat, but with each other. And that's something we don't really see too much all over the place. So I feel like everywhere else, it's just like, if you can, like, try to recreate this feeling, like, it feels good to be amongst peers that you ultimately respect. Okay, that's my, that's my soapbox, but I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, seeing the chat and everything that was going on. So thank you everybody, warm in the bottom of my heart. <laughs> so the piece that I wanted to jump into now is actually diving into motion and talking a lot about like those concepts and angles so we can start to understand what's going on there. So I think the first place that people typically start is when we're thinking about creative, it's diving straight into the actual like granular creative itself and then mark i got you this is where we get nice and close and then we talk about different ways that you can start to look at creative performance so in my view that i have here essentially what i'm now doing <laughs> i can't keep it up for long i'm sorry everybody i'm sorry i can't keep it up for long but in my view that i have here i'm looking at my concepts and you can tell i'm not actually focused on my granular creative quite yet what I'm actually focused on instead is higher level insights. So you can see here, I have us versus them versus listicle, five-star review, podcast style, and before and after. And what this style of report allows us to do is build better communication flows exactly like Jess had mentioned. So what does that mean as an example? That could mean I'm literally in a meeting with my team and I'm saying, hey, before and after, we've spent a ton of money on it, but doesn't seem to be providing us with the returns that we're happy with. What's going on? But on the other end, when we look at us versus them, we know we've spent a lot of money and we know that we're receiving really strong returns. So in this world, when I'm looking around at the rest of the team, I'm literally going to be like, team, let's continue to double down on us versus them. It's absolutely crushing it. And at this point, guess what? We all now have alignment on either what that one, two, or four week schedule will look like, like Jess was talking about. And to determine what we want to make, guess what? We need some inspiration along the way. So that means if we click on in us versus them, like I was just showcasing, what we're going to be able to see here is the creative that is all truncated by us versus them. And ultimately, what's the best performer along the way? So now we know everybody can focus on making more us versus them. But also guess what? This is the inspiration along the way that's gonna take it to the next level for you. Okay, everybody? Fantastic.
fantastic. And I think the final piece that I wanted to show everybody is that motion is not all about the high level strategic insights. It also jumps into the granular discussion too, whether it be iterative based or just in your day to day. So what I mean by that is if I jump into my top creatives report here, this specific view that I have is what we call our card view. So what I mean here is we're actually looking at creative in such a simple and easy way where no one's going to be overwhelmed. We can see everything as it relates to video performance and image performance, and then the associated hold rates, hook rates, and all of those different pieces. And from this point, if you need to communicate and easily action upon this as a next step, all you need to do is right click this card and copy it and paste it into a deck, or guess what? You can literally download the GIF and upload it to your deck so it automatically plays. So, so long are the days when you had to take a million steps of downloading information from Facebook, pivot tabling it yourself, copy and pasting into a deck, taking a link from Facebook, throwing it into a deck. Do I have to continue? Please don't make me continue. And I turn that into two steps for you all. Okay. So if anyone's curious, I'm just going to throw a quick poll up onto the screen if, as I, uh, as I remove my screen share really quickly. And what I'm curious about, again, is no pressure at all, but those who are interested, if you would like to learn more about motion, feel free and go ahead and hit yeah. If not, don't worry about it. And if you're on the fence, let me know what I got to do to make it happen. You need some more ASMR. I'm your guy. You can make that happen nice and easily. We're good to go. <laughs> everybody, how are we feeling? How are we feeling? I still see 300 people hanging out. Are, is everybody okay? Doing well? James is great. Sandra's to the moon. Still here. Alejandro in the building. Absolutely incredible. The only questions I have is if anyone else has any final questions. Okay. Maddie, don't even worry about it. Got your back. Thank you for attending. You are the real MVP at the end of the day. So if anyone else has final questions, let's just throw it into the chat. If not, don't even worry about it. Everyone, this has been an absolute blast. We're going to send those recordings out after the fact. So feel free to help that spread that so we can grow the community that we all see here today. And feel free to connect with Motion on, on, on all social platforms. Feel free to connect with myself on LinkedIn or Twitter. You know I'm on there. Um, but this has been an absolute blast, y'all. Let's do it. One more time, chat. Throw love. Throw love into the chat. We need to. This has been an absolutely amazing ride these past five weeks with you all, okay? Hey, hey, okay, okay, the love, the love. There definitely will be more seminars and webinars, so please subscribe to our email list because we're going to send them out. You know we're always dropping fire content, so we're going to continue. But everybody, this has been absolutely incredible. I love the love. You all are the best, and we're going to see you at the next one. Peace. It's time to ship more winning creative with Motion's creative analytics platform that helps you scale winners into unicorns and helps you figure out where your ads might need just a little more help. Join over 2,100 teams shipping winning ads with Motion like Viore, True Classic, Hexclad, and more. Get a free VIP tour today and you can see how Motion can help your creative strategists and your media buyers speak the same language.